Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. I am a uh, fellow here. It's my great pleasure to introduce Quill Lawrence, a friend and a colleague. He's the Middle East correspondent for BBC's, BBC News, The World. Uh, in the spring of 2000, he was a Pew Fellow, which took him to Iraq uh, and Syria. Uh, Quill also covered uh, Afghanistan in the final days of the Taliban. He's reported extensively on Iraq uh, for The World covered the assault on Fallujah and all of Iraq's elections. And now he's got a new book, Invisible Nation, uh, which is really the first book about the Kurds uh, in, uh, in many, many years. And obviously, what's going on in Kurdistan is, is uh, perhaps a model for what could happen in the rest of Iraq. So uh, Quill will speak for 20 minutes, and then we'll open it to Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much for all of you for coming out, and thanks, Peter, for having me. Um, my first trip to Iraqi Kurdistan uh, started in a beat-up orange and white taxi uh, accompanied by two low-level Ba'athist spies, my driver and my translator. <laughs> and um, as we moved north of the city of Kirkuk and the, the plains and the sort of desert wasteland of, of southern and central Iraq gave way. Uh, there was a huge ridge that rose up uh, to the north, and I couldn't help but think that somehow the Kurds must have gotten a thousand bulldozers and just pushed the earth up into a big wall, uh, just as if to say, down there that's Iraq, Arab Iraq, whatever. Uh, up here is Kurdistan. It's different. and. Indeed, it was springtime, and in the spring, Kurdistan is as green as anywhere on Earth. Beautiful uh, flowers, mountains, it doesn't look anything else, anything like the rest of Iraq. Um, as we rolled past the last Iraqi government checkpoint and towards the first uh, Kurdish militia Peshmerga checkpoint, um, my uh, driver and translator got a little bit nervous, and indeed, we were promptly arrested and taken to jail. But it was all in good fun. Um, for me, anyway, because uh, I knew that the Kurds were dying to have uh, media attention. Um, they'd been in this protected enclave, uh, created mostly through the efforts of the United States in 1991. Um, but they couldn't get their story out very easily, and, and they were dying to have uh, visitors come in and then tell their story to the rest of the world. Uh, my driver and translator didn't see it that way. They were quite nervous. And as they sat around the corner from me and I was being interviewed in my bad Arabic by the uh, Kurdish security official, he asked me, your driver, is he a spy? And I, knowing that they were in earshot, said, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I should start perhaps with more of an overview. Kurdistan, the three provinces in the north of Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, or now called the, the Kurdistan Regional, Regional Government, uh, is everything that the Bush administration promised for Iraq. It's a Muslim country, but it's moderate. It's pro-democracy, not a perfect democracy by any stretch of the imagination, but it's headed in that direction. It's pro-America. It doesn't even have any particular problem with Israel. Um, in, in such a dearth of good news about Iraq, you have to wonder why this success story isn't being advertised more loudly. Uh, and the answer is because uh, many people are afraid that Kurdistan might do too well and that its success could unite the region against it like no other event since the creation of Israel in 1948. None of the neighboring countries want the Kurds to succeed perhaps even as far as they have now in having autonomy within Iraq security within their region. Um, the Kurds understand this better than anyone. Uh, they're willing to limit themselves uh, up to now to this sort of virtual statehood where they are controlling almost everything that a state would control inside their region, but they aren't announcing, yes, we're independent. Uh, they'll never go back on the rights and freedoms that they've, they've won in the last 15 years, in which I talk about in my book. Um, and really, I don't think that their progress could be undone except by a catastrophe. And that catastrophe might just be the precipitous withdrawal of American forces from Iraq. 
I want to go back uh, more to the beginning. Um, m we Americans know much less about the Kurds than they know about us. Uh, the first Kurdish rebel against the government of Iraq, and there have been Kurdish rebellions against the government of Iraq since there was a government of a country of Iraq to rebel against. Um, the first one was a, a wild-eyed sheikh named Mahmoud Barzinji, who's usually pictured with a big walrus mustache and a ceremonial dagger and a flowing robe. Um, he was said to have carried, strapped to his arm, uh, pages from the Quran, <coughs> as well as uh, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Uh, Self-determination, he thought, in this new world order in 1919 was going to aid the Kurds and allow them to finally have uh, their own rule in their own homeland. Needless to say, he was wrong. And although this wasn't such an Ameri a, a direct American betrayal, uh, the Kurds feel that they've had a rather bumpy relationship with America over the years. Um, in, a, in a schoolyard in this Kurdish city of Erbil in 2003 in the winter, I went uh, with my radio microphone looking to make a little trouble and started interviewing 14-year-old, 15-year-old school kids, um, asking them if they were Iraqi or they, were they Kurdish. And m most of them immediately said, we're Kurds first. But I was also asking what they thought of America. America was, uh, was very obviously preparing to invade. Uh, and very quickly, I heard from a, uh, a young skinny kid with a little fluffy mustache that uh, he would never forget how Great Britain had denied the Kurds a nation in 1919 and how America and Henry Kissinger had betrayed the Kurds in 1975. Now, this boy wasn't alive in 1985, but uh, he still felt it fair to bring up. And I had to wonder how many American teenagers would know who Henry Kissinger is. But for the Kurds, he's a, uh, a, an infamous figure. Uh, this young man was referring to uh, one of the most important, what the Kurds would say, was a betrayal of, of their cause by the Americans in 1975 when the Shah of Iran, who was a great American ally at the time, was fighting with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Um, the Shah was funneling guns, which came, many of them through Israel, uh, to the Kurdish rebels so they could keep bothering Saddam. And America was supporting this plan. Uh, the reason they focus on Kissinger is that every time uh, the great Kurdish leader at the time, Mullah Mustafa Barzani, uh, would ask the Americans, uh, is this going all right? Uh, do you support us? He would get great encouragement. He said, we think you're doing a wonderful job. We won't let you down. And many times he sent a message through third parties to Washington saying, I'm not going to keep doing this unless America is, uh, is at my back. Um, with uh, little ceremony in 1975, uh, the Shah of Iran signed a compromise deal with Saddam Hussein and suddenly had no need of the Kurds. Almost overnight, uh, the supplies were cut and uh, the Kurds were, were stranded uh, facing the retaliation of Saddam's army. Uh, thousands of them died, many more fled. And the, the reason I think they blame Kissinger mo uh, for this betrayal is that even four or five days beforehand, when Kissinger uh, almost certainly knew that there had been a bargain, uh, he was still sending letters of support to Barzani. The, the uh, relationship with America goes on from there with a lot of disappointments for the Kurds. I in the 1980s, when Saddam Hussein had finally decided that the problem wasn't really Kurdish rebels in the north of his country, it was Kurds in the north of his country, and he decided to uh, take the old counterinsurgency maxim of uh, taking the water away from the fish to a new level by raising villages, cutting down trees, and even using poison gas, in one case in the town of Halabja, 1988, <coughs> killing 5,000 people in one day. Um, the world really didn't raise much of a fuss. Uh, not only did the Kurds feel betrayed by America, uh, who didn't raise any protest and, and was at the time aiding uh, Saddam Hussein in the war against Iran and covertly aiding Iran against Iraq, uh, but also the Sunni Arab neighbors. Uh, the Kurds are mostly uh, Sunni Muslims, and they, they got no sympathy from their co-religionists in the region. Uh, the next 
betrayal, they would say, was brief, but much more important. And it was one of uh, two things I refer to in the book as uh, accidents that created what we have today. Uh, two accidents made by two presidents named Bush. Uh, in 1991, uh, when uh, the President Bush Sr. assembled a, a coalition to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, <coughs> he had no intention of, of aiding the creation of a Kurdish homeland. He wanted a very neat war uh, with very limited achievable aims and an exit strategy. And the realists in his administration uh, foresaw chaos and perhaps a uh, great benefit to Iran if the U.S. Army and the coalition went all the way to Baghdad. Perhaps th today you can see why they felt that way. Um, uh, but after Saddam had been expelled from Kuwait, uh, President Bush Sr. went off script a couple of times in a few speeches. And he said something to the extent of, uh, there's a different way for this to end. The Iraqi people can rise up against the dictator. Now what President Bush meant, what the United States wanted, was for a Sunni Arab general, much like Saddam, but with a different name, someone they could shake hands with, to put a bullet in Saddam's head uh, and take over the government. It became, it was known as the one bullet policy. <laughs> the Kurds and the Shiites in Iraq, as you all know, heard a different message. For them it was a clear call to rebel and a clear message that America was at their backs once again. Uh, the rebellion lasted for a few days until people realized uh, that President Bush, that none of the coalition countries were going to support them. And then Saddam Hussein's retaliation began. At first, um, there was no response from the Allies. President Bush went fishing, and Prime Minister, then Prime Minister John Major, famously responded to a question saying, I don't recall asking those particular people to launch this particular insurrection. But soon, uh, the sight of Kurds fleeing across borders began to generate some sympathy. Now, the witnesses I've talked to about this exodus say they saw people leaving hospitals uh, carrying their own IV bags, walking across the mountains. In my book, you'll see pictures, uh, one of them furnished to me by uh, General Tony Zinni, who was in the region, of uh, barefoot Kurds, clearly in a stiff breeze, trying to get across the mountains, get across the border. Uh, to Turkey and being beaten back by uh, Turkish border guards. The entire nation knew uh, what it was to face Saddam Hussein's retaliation. The memories of halabja and poison gas were only three years old, and uh, a million and a half Kurds decided as one that anywhere but here was a good place to be. A million of them went across to Iran, uh, but the ones that got the media attention uh, were trying to get into Turkey. And I should say that uh, this incident and the way the media shamed America and France and Britain into acting was one of the reasons I decided to become a journalist. Um, the, the Kurds had learned towards the end of the 80s, uh, some of their best diplomatic people had learned that uh, they couldn't really face Saddam Hussein uh, militarily without outside aid and, and with him using poison gas. And they had started to develop uh, a pretty good media machine. They got the word out. Uh, about their exodus, and in fact the, the exodus of a half a million, some of them politically active Kurds moving into Turkey, wasn't welcome news for the Turks either. And the United States, Great Britain and France, along with uh, several other countries, decided to launch what was the first humanitarian intervention, a UN-sanctioned invasion of Iraq against the will of the sovereign government. And they built a, a, a small safe haven in northern Iraq uh, which I would say was the incubator for what we have today, which is a de facto Kurdish state. They did it entirely by accident. They never meant to create this, but uh, many of them, including, for example, the then ambassador to Turkey, Morton Abramowitz, realized quickly that that's what they had done. Uh, the Kurds then had uh, something of a, of a safe laboratory over the next 13 years. It wasn't always pretty. It was often quite ugly. They had a an idiotic civil war between the two major parties there. But they also had elections in which both sides campaigned. And uh, with uh, some help from Washington, they eventually stopped fighting and had a, uh, 
a de facto state that no, no one recognized living in a small landlocked enclave in the north of Iraq until the second President Bush came along and did something else by accident. Uh, President George W. Bush never meant to create Kurdistan either. Uh, his plan uh, to take out Saddam Hussein it included a major push from the north through Turkey. And in negotiations with the Turks to get the American army through, he was willing to give billions of dollars in aid and loans and also allow some 60,000 Turkish troops to accompany the U.S. Army going through uh, for uh, stabilization. To, it was what the, the, uh, the Turkish government said. The Kurds in northern Iraq at that time had a different opinion. I, I snuck back into Iraq my, my second trip there, uh, or rather my third trip to Iraq, my second trip to Kurdistan in uh, January of 2003 not knowing when the war was going to begin, but wanting to be there. I uh, lucked into a visa to Iran and then uh, managed to get their pseudo-official permission to, to go up to the border and sneak across the mountains uh, into Kurdistan. And when I got there, I found that the Kurds were worried not so much about Saddam Hussein, although they did fear that he might have a last gasp of chemical weapons to use against them. Uh, they were more worried about the Turks. They thought if the Turkish army came in, it would not be to stabilize northern Iraq, but to smack it down, to crush what had grown there. Uh, Turkey has its own very large and restive uh, Kurdish population, and they fought a uh, long war against Kurdish separatists in which both sides have used dirty tactics. Uh, they fear that the Kurdistan in northern Iraq might inspire their Kurdish population. And the... Uh, the Kurds in northern Iraq were terrified that the Turkish army was going to come in as a friend of the Americans and destroy what progress they had managed in the last 13 years. But then what I, you could almost call the battle for Kurdish independence was fought in the Turkish parliament on March 31st, 2003, when without firing a shot, uh, the Kurds won uh, one of their greatest victories. The Turkish parliament voted, as you all know, not to allow the United States to come to bring troops through. And this was a crushing blow for the Americans. All of the uh, American soldiers who had been loading and unloading their equipment off the, co the Turkish coast. Uh, but the Kurds were delighted. And uh, they were celebrating not only the fact that there were not Turkish troops coming through, they were also uh, now the only ally that the Americans had in the north. Uh, instead of having Turkish soldiers come in, the U.S. Special Forces, who wanted to act in the north, uh, not only to put pressure on Saddam Hussein, but also against an Islamist group called Ansar al-Islam, which was hiding out in the, the mountains of Kurdistan, the, the Special Forces had no one to turn to but these some 60,000 uh, Kurdish irregulars standing there with open arms, dying to work with U.S. soldiers. In uh, March of '03, I was standing on a ridge, no, I guess it was early April, um, watching as these Kurdish Peshmerga, they're called, those who face death is uh, the translation, uh, these soldiers working along with U.S. Special Forces teams. And you could see the chemistry between these two groups. Uh, the Kurds were awed with the way American soldiers could use a, uh, a small laptop and a little satellite dish to call in airstrikes against a mountaintop on the other side against this Islamist group, Ansar al-Islam. And they were also fascinated with the uh, little brown plastic package that contains the MRE, the meal ready to eat. They thought this was a phenomenal innovation for warfare. Um, the Americans were also impressed with the Kurds. I was talking with a Special Forces soldier uh, on this hilltop as the bombing uh, went on, and he said that the assault had begun this morning and uh, we saw the first uh, wounded Kurdish soldier come back. And uh, at first we were kind of laughing about him because at a distance he was limping and we thought maybe he'd turned his ankle and gotten scared and run away from the battle. When he got closer, we saw that he'd been shot through the chest. These are tough people, is what the soldier told me. And indeed, the Kurds are not used to medevac or any real medics whatsoever. If you get shot, you have to make it back. And this Special Forces soldier w was also just commented as he looked across the, the valleys, which were gorgeous green, and some of the mountains down there, which look almost like something you'd see in the Grand Canyon. Um, and he said, I had no idea. Couldn't you be in Ireland or something like that? I, he said, if this, were, if this were my land, I'd want to own it too. 
And I could tell that the soldiers were uh, drinking some of the Kurdish Kool-Aid at that point. <clears throat> the, uh, when the invasion came and Saddam fell, uh, the Kurds really thought they'd died and gone to heaven. Uh, not only was the dictator gone, but the people who America had put in charge of the post-invasion were old friends. Uh, one of them was Jay Garner. Uh, Jay Garner, General Jay Garner, had been in charge of the humanitarian invention in 1991. He was a, he was a uh, national hero in Kurdistan. And he was greeted like a hero when he came to visit up there a couple of days after he arrived in Iraq. The other friend that they were very happy to see um, was the uh, then uh, presidential envoy to the Free Iraqis, um, Zalme Khalilzad. Now, uh, he wasn't very well known at the time, uh, but some years back, before 1991, when the Kurds had come to Washington looking for some sort of sympathy and found closed doors, sometimes even been stood up at the State Department uh, because of Turkish sensitivities, there was one uh, undersecretary, pardon me, at the Pentagon who was willing to see them, a young Afghan-American named Zalme Khalilzad. Uh, they became friends, and although you wouldn't say he's necessarily a partisan of the Kurds, they felt comfortable, at least he knew who they were, uh, and they were looking forward to working with Zalme Khalilzad, who, as you all know, then became ambassador to Afghanistan, ambassador to Iraq, and now the United Nations. But uh, this feeling of euphoria quickly gave way as both Garner and Khalilzad were uh, unceremoniously replaced uh, by Paul Bremer. The Kurds knew uh, a little bit about Paul Bremer. He possibly knew even less about them. All they knew about him was that he had once worked for Henry Kissinger. And that's not a great thing to put on your... If you're going to Kurdistan, take that off your resume. That would be my <laughs> advice. Um, but he soon, soon proved that he knew even less about the Kurds when he came north uh, for his first meeting uh, in the city of Erbil uh, with, with Masoud Barzani, the son of the great warrior uh, Mullah Mustafa Barzani. There are portraits of Mullah Mustafa Barzani everywhere in that part of Kurdistan. And uh, Bremer, however, uh, walked up to Masoud Barzani and in a very nonchalant, informal American way said, hey, who's that guy? Uh, it was a bit of a faux pas, and even, even Bremer's staff stood there gaping at, the, at, at what their boss had just done. If, if the Kurds didn't like Bremer personally, they loved what he did with Iraq. Uh, one of his first or second actions, after having canceled a meeting with all of the Iraqi opposition leaders, he said in his memoir he did this to show them that he was in charge, uh, Bremer uh, abolished the army, which many people see as, as the seminal error in the post-invasion. Um, but the Kurds disagree, and Bremer then solidified his mistake by going up and asking the wrong person how he was doing. He went up to the north and met with Masoud Barzani and said, what do you think? I've abolished the army. And Masoud said, you're doing great. Uh, his uh, the current Prime Minister of the Kurdistan Regional Government, Netrevan Barzani, is a little bit, uh, well, he loves to tell a joke. He says, everybody dislikes Paul Bremer, poor Paul Bremer. I love Paul Bremer. You know, if it weren't for Paul Bremer, Iraq wouldn't be in the state it's in today. <laughs> it would be so much better. <laughs> and uh, the fact that he's willing to say this to a journalist with a microphone running shows uh, uh, perhaps a degree of cockiness, but uh, confidence that the Kurds feel uh, in being the one prosperous corner of Iraq and, um, and a feeling that they think they can, they can defend this now. Um, the, uh, I'll wrap up and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Uh, at the moment, Kurdistan has this prosperity. I'd say the biggest problem they have in the north is urban sprawl for all the building that's going up. There's still not a single U.S. soldier that's been killed in the north. Um, at the moment, though, they're really not sure, especially as uh, America is uh, going into a, a presidential election, what their fate will be. They see very plainly that the Shiite parties in the south, even though they're fighting now, all have clear ties to Iran. Um, even, even the 
the majority parties who are currently allied with America, they spend a lot of time in Iran in exile and they have clear connections. They see that the Sunni Arabs have ties to, and support from the Gulf, if only to counteract this growing Shiite current in the region. And the Kurds look around and see nothing but hostile neighbors. The Turks, the Iranians and Syrians all have a Kurdish population and don't want to see any sort of Kurdish independence grow. Uh, they still feel a lot of hostility from their Arab uh, uh, compatriots to the south. They're really pinning their hopes on America again. And for them, uh, the uh, well, I should say I, I spoke with uh, one of many Kurds who've come back to Iraqi Kurdistan now that uh, there's prosperity and security there. Um, there's a, a Kurd who'd been living in Stockholm, a uh, very comfortable life there, brought his whole family back and has a job with a telecommunications firm. And uh, he told me first of, off that if he has another son, and he said this without any irony, he said, I'm going to name him Bush. Uh, but then he said, I'm, I only think we're safe as long as the Americans stay. I'm leaving with the last American. Uh, with that, I'll take your questions. Well, Quill, thanks very much for that really lucid exposition. Um, I will take, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the first question if that's okay, um, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience. Please identify yourself when you ask a question. And uh, Quill, you might repeat the question just because for the TV audience. Sure. Um, three, three, qu three questions. One is the status of Kirkuk and what is likely to happen there. Two, uh, the administration argued that Ansar al-Islam was uh, part of the nexus between al-Qaeda and Saddam. Is there any truth to that? And what is Ansar al-Islam uh, doing today under its new name? And, and finally, port, uh, Condé Nast portfolio had a cover story about Kurdistan and the sort of economic miracle that's taking place there. And perhaps you want to just explain a little bit about what the economy is doing. Great, okay, three good questions and one on which you'll have as much or more expertise as, as I. Um, Kirkuk is uh, at the moment uh, a multi-ethnic city. It's not inside the Kurdish region. Uh, it's hard to mention Kirkuk without the uh, adjectives oil rich. Uh, it, maybe it has 20% of, uh, Ben Lando's in the audience, he can probably tell me exactly how much oil Kirkuk has. Maybe. Pe 12 billion barrels of oil in Kirkuk. Um, so it's enough oil to make uh, the Kurdistan region into something like Qatar, it, into one of the smaller, uh, disgustingly wealthy uh, Gulf Arab countries, um, not meaning to offend. <laughs> and uh, so needless to say, it's a huge prize, and it's hugely controversial. Turkey has a nightmare scenario in which the Kurds of Iraq get Kirkuk and its oil, manage to export this oil, and then start buying an air force and biting off chunks of Kurdistan, of Kurdish regions in Turkey, in Iran, and in Syria. They're not entirely wrong to fear this because, of course, this is all Kurdish populated area and there is some affinity. Uh, the city of Kirkuk was supposed to have a referendum. Uh, this was something that the Kurds uh, insisted be placed in the constitution. There was supposed to be a referendum on whether it would join the Kurdistan region uh, by the end of 2007, which that was in December, it passed very quietly. They kicked the can down the road and said that we had the referendum in June. I don't think it's going to happen uh, in June either. And now the United Nations uh, is talking about coming up with a more uh, creative solution for Kirkuk. Uh, the city has been stacked and unstacked ethnically so many times it's hard to say uh, who it belongs to. There are Turkomans, uh, ethnic Turkomans living there. There are many Arabs that lived there before. There are many Arabs that Saddam placed there in his attempt to ethnically gerrymander the city. And there are many, many Kurds there. Some of them uh, are Kirkuk returnees living in camps and waiting to get their property back. I think that the Kurds made a huge mistake uh, in 2003 not turning on the charm uh, they could have gone down to Kirkuk and said to everyone there, Arabs and Turkomans alike, and said, look, look to the south, look to the north. In Baghdad, everything's exploding. In Erbil, we're putting up buildings, every, new buildings every day. Which, 
which part would you rather be associated with? It should have been an easy sell. But uh, in, in the aftermath of the invasion, instead there was a lot of what, we, what the U.S. Army started calling house jackings. Um, and there was also, once the Kurds got in and uh, took most of the positions in the Kirkuk uh, government, they, uh, they tended to play out a bunch of petty squabbles between the two Kurdish parties, and they weren't very impressive. I think now they are turning on that charm, uh, turning to that tactic for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because it was the most sensible thing to do in the first place, to get people to willingly join and, and be oriented toward the, toward the north instead of the horrific violence that still does continue in the south despite the success of the surge. Um, but also, I think the Kurds have realized they can't take Kirkuk. And that uh, while they're very comfortable right now in, from a security standpoint in the north with their militiamen and their population that calls the security forces every time they see uh, an, an, a bearded man driving a car, it's worse than Miles Davis in a Jaguar. I mean, they j call the police. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, in Kirkuk, they would be an occupying force in much of the city. And I think they've realized that they just can't do that. They're not good at it, and they wouldn't be any better at it than the Americans have been. So I think they're, they're starting to be more willing to bargain on Kirkuk uh, in, on this constitutional uh, provision that there should be a referendum. And I think we'll see them bargaining very hard, but with more flexibility than in the past. Um, Ansar al-Islam, going back into, uh, as you said, the lead up to the war, and even uh, as late as 2005, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and Vice President Cheney were citing the fact that Ansar al-Islam, a group that did have connections to bin Laden and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, was operating in Iraq. What they often always failed to mention was that they were operating in a part of Iraq that Saddam Hussein had no control over. And I think it probably just suffices to say that there is no there's no link that uh, Saddam Hussein was, uh, was aiding Ansar al Islam and therefore cooperating somehow with al-Qaeda. Um, there appears to be one uh, Mukhabarat agent that he sent to the north in an attempt to talk to them to see what was going on. And, and there, there were uh, probably some Ansar al Islam people getting medical uh, care in Baghdad. It wasn't clear that they were with uh, the consent or the knowledge of the regime. Uh, but there have been some really strange bedfellows around there, as you know. I Iran, which is uh, Shiite and had terrible objections to the Afghan, the, to the Taliban government in Afghanistan, they'd murdered some of their diplomats, um, was still aiding at some point some of the uh, Ansar al-Islam people who were traveling between Afghanistan and Iraq. It wasn't clear that this was uh, a government policy. They say in Iran that the government is whoever gets to the building first that morning. Uh, but uh, there were some people who got some favors and, and were released. Some people were captured with training videos in Iran and then were let to go on. But uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, Zarqawi, for example, being allied with Saddam, I think that's been found to be baseless. What was your last question? I forgot. Just the uh, economic situation. Yeah, the, the economy in northern Iraq is, is doing very well. There's, a, there's building, uh, and you can now see day laborers coming from Arab Iraq into the north, which they find quite a turn of events after so many decades of Kurds being an underclass in Iraq. Suddenly there are Arabs forced to go into this northern uh, sector, part of the country and, and work the, the uh, lowest paid jobs. I, I was interviewing some of these Arab day uh, laborers in the city of Sulaymaniyah as they were going to sleep on the steps of the mosque that night. And, well, some, some of them seemed to be very wary of criticizing, and, and they, were, they knew where they were, so they didn't want to say anything against the Kurds. Uh, one of them in particular, I think it had a little bit to drink, said that, well, you can't believe it, the, the Kurds, they're treating us like Jews, which he, he found appalling. <laughs> um, so the, the economy up there is booming, but it still needs to uh, get, and I think there, there's a very uh, strong lobbying operation by the Kurds here in Washington 
to get recognized as different from the rest of Iraq. They would like the State Department to differentiate between someone who wants to go invest in Baghdad, where you would have to travel around in heavily armored vehicles with armed guards and, uh, and really can't leave the green zone. They'd like the State Department to say, uh, the North is different, it's, it's open for business. They've started a, uh, a media campaign, The Other Iraq. Indeed, you can fly to northern Iraq from Amman, direct flights now, I believe, from Germany as well, um, and go there. There are a lot of people doing business there. The key, of course, is oil. Uh, there's some new oil being discovered and uh, developed in the north of Iraq, and uh, many small oil companies have uh, gone and have started exploiting this oil, but there's a great threat coming from the central government and the oil minister in particular that these contracts won't be recognized, that indeed these companies could be blacklisted for some of the larger contracts with the, the huge amounts of oil that are, remain in, in southern and central Iraq. Um, and so it's this sort of blackmail going on. The Kurds would say all that we've done up here is in accordance with the, Kur with the Iraqi constitution. And I should note that the Kurds, they talk about this constitution a lot, mostly because they wrote it uh, for the most part. Uh, they had a, and they got everything they wanted out of it. I've never heard anybody else in Iraq talk about the Constitution. Um, they seem to think that it, this document is going to protect them somehow. Maybe they're right. Um, but they say that their oil contracts are all legal under the Iraqi Constitution, and that since the rest of Iraq doesn't have an oil law yet, they're really not sure under what authority the oil minister is telling them they can't do these contracts. But let me take some questions from the audience. Please. Uh, Carol Wasser, interested citizen. Could you talk a little more about the connection with the Kurds in Iran and Turkey and what that means in terms of stability in the region? Sure. The question's about uh, connections between Turkish, Iranian, Iraqi Kurds. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to define what is a Kurd. I've uh, decided in my book to just say anyone who says he's a Kurd really is a Kurd because you can't even say, you could say I was uh, uh, giving this presentation in Philadelphia the other night and said a Kurd I usually say is someone who speaks Kurdish and says he's a Kurd and one of the Kurds in the audience corrected me he said no, a lot of Kurds in Turkey don't speak Kurdish they haven't been allowed to study Kurdish so um, there are people that goes has a history going back for thousands of years uh, some people even say that the uh, the Medes one of the wise men who found uh, the the baby Jesus was a, a Kurd possibly um, but uh, They've been divided now uh, for almost a century by these uh, political boundaries, which I would say the strongest one really is the Turkish line. It's because of geography. The, the Turkish Kurds speak a different dialect from the Iraqi Kurds and the Iranian Kurds. Um, but we're already seeing uh, this affinity playing itself out. I have a chapter in the book called Something That Does Not Love a Wall. And indeed, there doesn't seem to be any way to prevent uh, this contact in Turkey in particular but many people were worried uh, after the invasion that Iraqi Kurdistan's success would inspire Turkish Kurds but the first couple of examples came instead from Iran and Syria in Syria uh, just after the invasion there was a, a riot at a soccer stadium and it was an Arab team that was playing a uh, Kurdish team in the Kurdish part of Syria the, the, which is the north uh, east corner of the country, the Arab team started chanting the name Saddam Hussein uh, to antagonize the other side, and the Kurdish side started chanting the name George Bush, which, as you recall <laughs> at the time, it did seem like uh, the Bush administration was on a roll and thinking about knocking over the dominoes all the way around the region, and Syria looked like it could be next. So uh, a riot ensued at this football so uh, soccer game, and uh, and the Syrian forces put it down with characteristic violence. Uh, more protests ensued across the country. And at that time, a lot of Kurds in Syria, and the main complaint of Kurds in Syria is that they have no documents. Many of them are non-persons. They don't have a passport from a Syrian passport. Um, many of them decided to go across, and if they were going to be non-citizens, why not do it in a country where they can speak their own language and where their kids can go to, to school in their own language in Kurdish. Indeed, at the Kurdish universities, there are about seven of them in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, they give free education to, to any Kurd, and they know full well that there are Iranian, Syrian Kurds coming in. I uh, 
at Suleimaniya University, one of the Kurdish cities close to the Iranian border, spoke to some young Iranian Kurds who told me very happily that, yes, we're here to get an education because we need to learn an ideology to go home and overthrow our government. <laughs> so there is uh, definitely some action across those borders. Is the survival of Kurdistan dependent upon an enduring U.S. presence in Iraq? Is, uh, it seems that they have a viable economy, an independent military force, uh, and relative cohesion <coughs> compared to the rest of Iraq. And I think even, isn't the president still a Kurd? Yes, that's so right. A, um, in whatever reshuffling of power comes after the uh, U.S. presence in Iraq, couldn't the Kurds broker some kind of so the question is about how disastrous a, a, a U.S. withdrawal would be and whether the Kurds would be able to hold their own uh, inside the Iraqi government. There, there certainly, uh, as you say, as you point out, the, the president of Iraq uh, right now is Jalal Talabani, who was a Kurdish rebel in the mountains for many, many years uh, and is now the first, first uh, non-Arab president of Iraq. Um, they have many of the key ministries. Uh, and they're, they're full participants in that government. It would seem difficult uh, for, if this current system of government continues, of course, they're 20 percent of, of the Iraqi population, perhaps, and uh, they punch above their weight because they've got a lot more experience uh, after 13 years of, of, uh, of ruling themselves. I think they're not so much afraid just of the U.S. leaving and not being there anymore. They can defend themselves within their region against uh, any other uh, force in, inside Iraq. Uh, one of the great things from their point of view about the army and the security forces being abolished by Paul Bremer was that they then became the second largest military force in Iraq, uh, smaller than the Americans but larger than the Brits. Um, but I think what they're more worried about is the consequences of this withdrawal and I guess precipitous, uh, I meant to imply uh, a withdrawal without uh, some provision for keeping the country together and preventing the civil war there from uh, becoming a regional war. And that's a huge fear that if the United States left, Iran would clearly have its interests. Uh, the uh, Sunni Arab countries would also want to set up a bulwark against Iran. Perhaps Turkey would see Kurdistan as a, as a convenient buffer between it and the neighbor's house on fire. But Turkey might also uh, take the opportunity without American troops there to go in and, and put down uh, this Kurdish progress. So the, uh, they're worried that uh, this regional war would leave them without a patron. And they can defend themselves against all the AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades and mortars you want. But Iran and Turkey have helicopters and tanks and could easily crush them. And indeed, because of the, the uh, Turkish Kurdish separatist group, the PKK, that is operating along the mountains there and also has a branch that operates against Iran, we've already seen uh, Turkey and Iran becoming bedfellows here against the PKK. Um, and it's a deep concern for the Americans and even deeper for the Kurds. Absolutely. Um, the question is about uh, some of the, uh, the uglier side of, uh, of the Kurdistan region's uh, um, uh, government. And, uh, the, uh, indeed, it's, it's uh, far from a perfect system. You've got two parties that are entrenched. And uh, while there is some competition between them, uh, probably for a share in the corruption, um, where you have something of a constituent system where the Aga of one village might decide to switch from the KDP to the PUK because he would get more kickbacks, uh, something like that, which you could say is a version of democracy, but not necessarily an ideal one. Um, the corruption in Kurdistan is, is rampant, uh, as you well know. Um, the, uh, 
people complain in the uh, the KDP, that's one of the parties side of Kurdistan, that you really need to know someone named Barzani in order to get certain contracts. And there have been human rights researchers there who said they, they uh, have documented cases where uh, people have been imprisoned for not turning over a share of their profits. Uh, there's probably just as much corruption on the PUK side, which is uh, dominated by the uh, by Jalal Talabani. But over there, because they have a, a Politburo and a bu and more of slightly more diffused power, not everyone has the same name, so it's not as easy to see the corruption. Um, I don't know how it compares to corruption in Iran, corruption in Jordan. I don't think Transparency International has done Kurdistan yet in terms of, but. Uh, you see a, a, a crackdown up there. Uh, there have been journalists imprisoned uh, for uh, for criticizing personal uh, criticisms on the leadership. What I would say about it, though, is that the Kurds are in an interesting position because they're so dependent on the United States and their patronage. It means that when the Kurdistan government throws a journalist in jail, for suggesting that there's corruption in the Barzani family, for example, they again they get showered with this opprobrium, and I think in the first week of May there's going to be a committee to protect journalists report on on uh, the situation for journalists in in Kurdistan, Iraq. But the, they're so dependent on the goodwill of the international community to protect them that in some ways they can be coerced on issues of human rights and corruption, and they're very worried about their reputation and might hopefully be encouraged to do something about it. Because if you're depending on America to save you from the wolves around, uh, you can't be letting stories get out, letting, uh, letting the, your image become one of corruption and repression. And so in a way, in, within the region, whereas you, you can criticize uh, some countries for human rights, say Saudi Arabia, you say you, know, you beheaded people, and they'll say yes that's fine with us. In, in Kurdistan, uh, they're, they're sensitive, I think, and they're hopefully in a position where they'll be able to be uh, influenced away from that, these, these practices because they're so dependent on international opinion. Yes? Um, I'm, my name is Byron Dibble. Um, I want to follow up on an earlier question. You mentioned that the Kurds were worried about the withdrawal of U.S. forces. You mentioned before that that they, they remember what the U.S. has done and not done to them and for them. And they clearly also know what their neighborhood's like. Are they, do you have any hint of, about what they might be thinking about in the event that the U.S. does withdraw its forces and things start to happen? Um, it's inconceivable that they wouldn't be planning or thinking about contingency. Did you get anything on that? Well, they're certainly keeping the channels open uh, to all of the neighbors. and. I think that they're hoping that the uh, business interests that are starting with Turkey will uh, begin to have enough weight to prevent uh, the Turks from wanting to smash that. And it's interesting that uh, I was in Kurdistan in Iraq most recently in October for one of the uh, one of the threatened Turkish invasions. And even when the rhetoric coming out of Ankara and out of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan was at its its fieriest. Uh, I was still able to drive freely across that border. They never closed the border, and I think that's a sign that the Turkish businessmen who are uh, making billions in Iraq, in northern Iraq, are are starting to have enough sway that they can uh, they can at least have a say in this. Um, and the Kurds have always uh, kept their channels open. Uh, uh, Jalal Talabani has great relations with Iran. Um, I'm not sure about Syria. I think that they do, and there, there's a chapter in the book I call The Believers, about the Kurdish politicians who really do want Iraq to succeed. And I think they want this because they see that they're much better off within a larger country of Iraq, not only just as a fig leaf to keep people from saying you declared an independent Kurdistan, but also because uh, it, they, under the Constitution, they'll get a share of Iraq's oil, and all of Kurdistan's oil is nothing compared to 17 percent, which is their share, of, uh, of Iraq's massive reserves. 
So I think that they truly do want to stay in. But what uh, the Kurdish leadership have told me is that uh, there's, we do want to stay in. We know it's in our interest. We know we're lost uh, if this plan doesn't work out. But if the rest of Iraq just falls off in, in civil war, there's nothing we're going to be able to do to stop it. And that's where they're counting on this, uh, this appeal to America to sort of save the, the pro-democratic enclave that you've created here. Um, I, I'm not fully answering your question. I don't really know. I, they see it as a disaster if America pulls out. And they're pushing very hard for America to put a permanent base in Iraqi Kurdistan. Even early on, they would uh, take one of the, uh, some of the military uh, leadership from Mosul. I talked to one executive officer, uh, a major, who said that he had been invited to something in Erbil. So he went from Mosul over to Erbil for this ceremony. And then suddenly he saw himself being filmed. And it was clearly an attempt to make it look like he was you know, pointing out where we're going to be putting the bases and how we're going to be staying here forever. And he, so they've been very wary about that. And that's also why you don't see a whole lot of American troops in Kurdistan, because they're worried about the optics. Yeah. One of the things that is characteristic of Kurdish history, of course, is this uh, factionalism um, that has gone on for an awful long time and that has been very uh, destructive. And how did they overcome that? And in particular, I'm quite interested in the role of the diaspora and the role of learning back from the diaspora in Europe. Uh, there's a Kurdish TV, as you know, diaspora Kurdish TV. How did that learning occur so that eventually the PUK and the KDP were able to strike a deal? There were talks in Ireland about that. Um, how did that occur um, after, you know, given this really uh, deep activity that they had? Right. The question is about the rift between the Kurdish parties and how it healed or if it's healed. Um, this rift went on for years between these two parties that essentially, uh, I think you could say one thought Kurdistan was a good idea and the other thought Kurdistan was a really good idea. That's the level of difference <laughs> between their platforms. Um, and I won't say which was which. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think the most important thing for them really was that in the 1990s, under the protection of a British and American and for a while French no-fly zone, uh, they screwed up a lot and had a horrible, stupid civil war. About 6,000 people were killed in it. Um, and they figured out that they couldn't eliminate each other militarily. Um, they wanted to badly and, and failed. Even with interventions uh, from help from Iran, even Saddam Hussein invading through to the north at one stage, uh, they, they couldn't wipe each other out. And then in 1998, with some help from the Americans, uh, there was a deal uh, that was uh, brokered here in Washington, finally, after the Drogheda peace talks and others, you know, the, the Irish peace talks you're talking about as well. Um, and they started a very cold peace with two clear spheres in the north of Iraq. Um, and that has been softening slowly. I, I'm not really sure I don't, about uh, the role of the, the diaspora in this. Um, there were these satellite TV stations, but the KDP and the PUK each have their own. A and in other ways, the, the conflict up there was never really between the Kurdish people. I think people thought it was a terribly stupid uh, thing, and most of my uh, good, close Kurdish friends uh, despise both parties equally, which I think is a very healthy, democratic way to feel. <laughs> um, but uh, the, there was one interview in the... Uh, I, in the book about uh, during the Civil War, a Kurd who was driving across Kurdistan and passing all these checkpoints, and every time he would pass a checkpoint, KDP or PUK, they would accuse him of being a spy for the other side, and they would take out some piece of paper in his packet of cigarettes and say, this is a secret code, and they would strip him, and people were beaten up. Um, and uh, he said, not once did either of them ask me if I was a, a Ba'athist spy for Saddam Hussein. Um, so I, I think at the moment that rift is, it's getting better. In the, inside the Kurdistan regional government, there are still four ministries that uh, are split. They have sort of a KDP and PUK uh, minister. 
And they're, I don't know if when they'll be able to homogenize their military, for example, and when Barzani's fighters will think of themselves, you know, and Talibani's fighters will think of themselves as one army necessarily. Um, but that said, they've made a lot of progress. The, the, the representative of the Kurdish government, the Kurdistan region here in Washington, Kubad Talibani, uh, is the son of, of Mam Jalal Talibani, the president. He's very clearly PUK. But he, he works directly for Netshirvan Barzani, who's one of the hardline KDP uh, family. They seem to be the beginning of a next generation that might work together, might see a greater, uh, that, that they need to rise above their squabbles. Um, but, and so they're making progress on this, but they're not, not out of the woods yet. Yes, ma'am. I have a, two, two questions, sort of related. The, the PKK, um, uh, the terrorist organizations that Turkey has been conducting cross-border operations against, to what extent, if any, does the Kurdish regional government have any control over their activities? Is it complicit? Is it a tacit approval? Is it, I'm going to turn my head and pretend like I don't know what you're doing? Is there any kind of support? Do they have any kind of influence over the PKK? That's, that's my first question. And then the second one, um, you know, I understand why Turkey would be opposed to terrorist acts within their own borders, um, but we've long heard about Turkey and Iran's fears of larger Kurdistan because it threatens their own territorial sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, given the gains that the Kurds have been able to achieve in northern Iraq, that that dream or desire for a broader Kurdistan that goes beyond those borders or what's the KRG um, will continue to exist if they're successful in establishing Okay, two good questions about the PKK and Pan uh, and the Pan Kurdish movement. Uh, you can buy in Iraqi Kurdistan a map of Kurdistan, which extends from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. It's a bit of an exaggeration, um, I would think, uh, but uh, it does show that there is this. Uh, there's a romantic notion about this greater Kurdish homeland somehow being uh, united, and I think that's in large part what. Uh, supports some of the, of this the PKK. Um, it, it's interesting to me that despite the fact that the Kurdistan government, both of those parties have fought against the PKK in the past, sometimes allied with them, but but uh, certainly in competition with them uh, more often, and have no interest in in having anything to do with them now. Um, every time I go to see the PKK in the mountains, my driver hugs them. Uh, so, meaning regular Kurds in northern Iraq have uh, sort of a romantic notion about them. They are the only ones who are fighting for this greater Kurdistan idea that everyone knows is not practical. At the same time, it's hard really to define the PKK's ideology. Uh, I've been up there and had uh, some PKK guerrillas draw me a, a diagram because I really couldn't understand it as they were explaining it. And it, it seems to change every time their imprisoned leader decides to rewrite his memoirs. It's, uh, it's not really clear to me. Uh, they said that they were fighting for uh, a separation you know, within uh, Turkey for a greater Kurdistan. Now they say that they want an autonomous region in Turkey and in Iran and in Syria, just like what's you know, the model that they've seen in northern Iraq. But I, I think essentially they're in a position where they're stuck in the mountains. They can't come down. A lot of them are young. I meet a lot of young Iranians up there, young Iranian women in particular. Um, and I think for many of them, they've left a horrible existence at home uh, where, and they see no other way out and they, they're attracted to this mountain life. And then once they get up there, it's very hard for them to come down. There's also a lot of ex-PKK fighters in, in northern Iraq hiding out. But the PKK has been playing an interesting game as soon as uh, around the time of the U.S. invasion, they redivided and they started with each national subsidiary. They said, we're going to separate. The, the Turkish Kurds will be the PKK still. And I won't use their actual names because they change their names so often. It's sort of irrelevant. Um, our Iraqi volunteers in the PKK will become a, a nonviolent party, uh, sort of like a Sinn Féin. And indeed, that party, the Kurdistan Democratic Solution Party, did run in some of the elections in Iraq. Uh, and uh, the Syrians will also be separate, nonviolent, and the only other armed wing is going to be the Iranian branch, the Pajak, P-J-A-K. As a matter of fact, they're going to be totally separate 
separate command and control. We like them, but we have nothing to do with them. As a matter of fact, if you all in America wanted to go and help them out, why? We, you wouldn't be helping us out, that's for sure, and you wouldn't be crossing your own laws against uh, aiding groups that you've classified as terrorists. What's interesting is that the United States, uh, which has many times said that it, uh, the PKK, by any of its names, is a terrorist organization, and Europe also classifies them as such, isn't classifying the Pajak, the Iranian branch, the, f the group of Kurds fighting against Iran, they haven't classified them yet as a, a terrorist organization. Uh, and it, that's the only clear evidence. There's no other evidence, though, despite many claims in the region, that the U.S. is helping Pajak, uh, aiding Pajak against Iran. But it, it's a pretty curious inconsistency. Um, and uh, you asked about the Kurdistan region. Uh, in the regional government, are they supporting the PKK? They have no clear links. There was a lot of tolerance. Uh, for, uh, even American soldiers going in there uh, in 2003 were told to don't ask, don't tell. And they would they'd be warned away from PKK uh, uh, camps. And if they saw them, they would look the other way because they just didn't want another fight. And they still don't, really. Those are great mountains for guerrilla warfare. I've walked up there down these blind alleyway canyons where one guy with a machine gun could hold off hundreds. Uh, Saddam Hussein, even with poison gas, couldn't wipe the Iraqi Kurdish rebels out of those same mountains. So, um, I mean, many within the Turkish government have observed that uh, you've crossed that border two dozen times now to wipe out the PKK. It's hard to see how another time is going to help. Uh, I think that, that finally, after some very cocky and inflammatory statements on the part of the Iraqi Kurds, uh, they finally got the message. Uh, in the last six or eight months when uh, their uh, protection from America started to look a little bit uh, less solid. Uh, they had been counting on what's been a terrible patch of Turkish-American relations to get them through this. And, uh, but since October, uh, America has apparently been giving the Turks real-time intelligence on the movements of the PKK. Um, this might help the Turks take care of them. They've also pressured the Kurdistan regional government in Iraq to, uh, to shut things down, and it's now much harder for me to drive up and see them. So, uh, yes, sir. Sure. I think that the major change, I'll answer the second question first, which is about the, the separation of the parties. I think that the major change is coming soon, and that will probably happen with the passing of uh, Mam Jalal Talabani from the political scene. Uh, he'll finish out his term as president, but he's in his mid-70s, 
and uh, it's it's hard to imagine him remaining such a robust presence for for too much longer in in politics. And many, uh, you say, the Kurdish intellectuals I've spoken with think that his party, the PUK, might splinter uh, when he leaves the scene. And in fact, his lieutenant, one of his most important, his second in command for many years, Nushirwan Mustafa, has already separated and formed his own party. And then you'll have a different dynamic. I think the Barzani KDP party will always be strongly linked with that family and command loyalty. Uh, and maybe you'll see a lot of other parties uh, that can form a coalition to be a loyal opposition to the KDP. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Um, but I think that might be, might be the most likely way for, for this uh, two-party system to change. In, in terms of the, the PKK, uh, why the, the Kurds... Oh, first of all, I meant to clarify, I, I, the Pajak is the only group besides the, the Turkish-based PKK who are staging violent attacks. The, the, the PKK is still attacking Turkey. They, they claim that they've had a ceasefire, uh, which the Turks have violated uh, hundreds of times, and they've had to act in self-defense. But it looks as though that they're, they're crossing the border to attack. Um, Pajak is also attacking. It seemed to be a separation created entirely for some sort of plausible deniability about an outside power helping Pajak against Iran. Um, can the can Talibani's PUK take that group out of the mountains? They probably could. They outnumber them 30 to 1. Uh, but it's very costly uh, attacking those mountains, and the PUK know it very well because they hid out in those mountains in, in the 80s. Uh, they fought against the PKK in the past, and there's a graveyard uh, with all of the Peshmerga who died trying to get them out of the mountains. It's not their top priority. Turkey's trying to make it their top priority to punish them for not doing their work to eliminate the, the PKK. Uh, I, it's very unlikely that they'll do that. The, they do have a domestic political consideration that has some romance for the PKK, much, I would imagine, like uh, Irish Americans felt for the IRA. Um, but and the, even though they are trying to keep good relations with Iran, and they're trying to, to build relations with Turkey. There's an unfortunate tradition in the region of trying to keep uh, your finger in, in your neighbor's uh, business that way, and maybe having a, a group that could carry out attacks. There have been some implications in the past that uh, threats by uh, Barzani that he could, if Turkey misbehaved, he could turn up the heat. And this was interpreted as saying, well, he could help the PKK. He later said those comments were out of context, but I think it's uh, it's sort of a tradition in the region to try and have a rebel group in your neighbor's country, and as you smile at them in the negotiations, you also have a tool that you can use. Yes? My name is Jan Sullivan. You talked about the political reality in the Kurdish region, the economic vitality, but it's been argued in different arenas around the world that education men and women, boys and girls, is really the strength for stability. Um, what did you see in your travels in that area as to the educational system and the strength of that for both um, boys and girls? Well, it's funny because while Kurdistan at the moment is uh, the most stable and prosperous part of a an Iraq that is in ruins, for decades and decades it, it was the most impoverished part of the country. I, in, in fact, the, when one thing that's striking about Kurdistan in Iraq is that you don't see trees and you don't see villages because they were all raised. You'll see lines of trees that are, when I first started going to Kurdistan, were this high and now they're maybe coming up to here. But uh, So despite the fact that they're doing very well now, uh, they've got a long, long way to go. And as an aside, that's even one of the reasons why uh, Kurds in Turkey might look to the south and say, well, it's very nice they have their country, but uh, the Kurds living in Turkey, even though they're some of the poorest people in Turkey, are miles and miles ahead of any of the other Kurdish populations. In terms of education, uh, in the 1990s, they were having a, a hard time getting materials, especially materials in Kurdish. Um, they were trying to switch over from an Arabic education system to a Kurdish education system. There were UN programs in there uh, helping 
them develop. But, for example, the universities in, in Kurdistan are generally considered to be pretty lousy, I hate to say. There are some new ones being built, uh, particularly an American university being built in Sulaymaniyah, uh, that are going to try to aspire to a higher level. And I know they're looking for a lot of contact over, over here and other international places to try and shore that up. But they've got a long, long way to go. Yes, sir. I want to ask a question, why uh, the Iraqi Kurds uh, perceive Turkey as a threat against their existence in the region? I mean, given the fact that even in your presentation I got the same uh, position, given the fact that uh, before the first Gulf War, Turkey provided shelter for Iraqi Kurds pushing north by Sastan. And uh, again, uh, during, after the first Gulf War, the operation provide comfort was carried out by the help of Turkey, you know, the defense of Turkey, 100 percent. And uh, about a hundred years in the region, in different political geographies, they have lived very friendly, and there is a good brotherhood even now in uh, in north of Iraq, and you yourself have uh, witnessed the uh, Turkish investments. Even some of the Iranians do like to do the same. I don't. Know. But I mean, there is no threat against any. Iraqi Kurdish existence in the region. There may be some corruption in the politics. It's much more similar to a family corporation or family members at different mm. key political or bureaucratic points. So the question is basically about why the, the Kurds perceive it, the Turks as a why threat. Do you uh, try to perceive like this? Mm. Turkey's sure, okay. He'll, yeah. he'll answer the question. So he gets the, it. In, in, in 1991, uh, certainly, uh, then President Azal was uh, was already suggesting this idea of a safe haven, and, and he, uh, I think, alone in recent uh, Turkish uh, leaders was saying, "Wow, you know, we could really have a great relationship with Kurdistan. They might have some oil down there, and gosh, they've got no place to take it but through Turkey." And I and I would say as a preface that there, I think, are so many uh, Turks who want to do nothing more than do great business in northern Iraq and, and take advantage of that and have friendly relations. Um, but in 1991 as well, it should be noted that uh, Turkey was almost re accused of refoulement, of not allowing refugees in. And indeed, there were a lot of instances of the Turks just allowing a trickle to come through, whereas the Iranians, for example, took about a million in immediately. The concern then was that Turkey would have a new Gaza Strip inside Turkey, and all of these probably politically active uh, Kurds living there, it seemed like a very bad idea to them. So in some ways, the, more than anything, the, uh, the, the safe haven was built to protect Turkey from a wave of refugees that it didn't want. The recent uh, feelings of a Turkish threat are pretty clear to see. In 2003, I was in in May of 2003, after, briefly after the, the regime fell, I was in the city of Kirkuk, where Colonel Bill Mayville, who was in charge of the city, told me that the night before he had apprehended some Turkish commandos uh, who had been masquerading as a Red Crescent ambulance team. And they were bringing in uh, weapons into the city of Kirkuk. He didn't know why, but the fact that they were pretending to be an ambulance team was enough for him to decide they were up to no good. He gave them a meal and sent them home. There were Turkish uh, observers along with the American military there, so it seemed strange that they would also be having this covert operation. July 4th of 2003, I don't need to tell you what that date means, but I imagine I need to tell most, it's, it's entirely, almost entirely unknown in America, but it's an event that was burned into the psyche, I think, of, of the Turks. On July 4th, in the city of Suleymaniyya, uh, U.S. forces apprehended a group of, again, Turkish commandos, who they said 
were on a mission to assassinate a Kurdish leader in uh, that region of Iraq with, they thought, the aim of destabilizing the situation and possibly giving uh, Turkey an excuse to intervene. Uh, this caused a diplomatic incident, especially because the U.S. soldiers, who were not terribly pleased towards Turkey because, uh, well, for many reasons at that point, but uh, to see Turkey trying to cause trouble, uh, they put black hoods over the commando's heads and put them in plastic cuffs and sent them home as if they were on their way to Guantanamo. Um, and this has been a huge source of, of, uh, of I think, anti-American feeling in Turkey. And it's one of these incidents which I think has now been explained away as a rogue operation, uh, although the uh, high-level uh, Turkish military who were in charge have been put out to pasture uh, and denied promotion. Uh, but this incident is, is one of the reasons that they feel there's a, a, a real threat there. So. Um, sure, is there anyone who hasn't asked a question who would like to? You had your hand up before. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, John Morrissey from National University of Ireland, Galway. I have, I have a question about U.S. bases, and I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I could t try and tie it back into this sort of anticipated U.S. withdrawal, which you know, Kurds are very fearful about. Um, and also the, the very success story that you know, Kurdistan is, uh, and that, as you quite rightly point out, has not been sufficiently broadcast, perhaps. So I'm wondering about what, what is the reluctance within the U.S. military that you can sort of, you know, uh, furnish with us about why they haven't thought about, you know, setting a base for, for that region? Um, is, it, is it simply explained away by the, the, the sort of Turkish-American relations, or are there some other things going on? Yeah, the question is about... Yeah. And, and can I also add to that? I mean, are you aware of uh, any ca what the candidates' positions are about a U.S. military presence in Kurdistan going forward? I mean, outline those. Well, first of all, that, I mean, that's part of the answer to the question. It's not a military decision. Uh, I, would, I would imagine that the military would say, and for a while the military has been using Kurdistan for R&R. &R. Uh, one of the, the hotels I'd like to stay at was actually taken over by them, much to my chagrin. Uh, but it's a place where an American soldier, it's the only place in Iraq where an American soldier could uh, walk down the street, sip a beer in a, uh, in a restaurant without worrying, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, but it's not a military decision. It, it's, a, it's clearly a political decision. And uh, indeed, the, the candidates are, are, well, from the Kurdish perspective, uh, they hear this uh, talk of John McCain in a hundred years, and I think they think that's quite all right with them. Um, they uh, see Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and um, Mrs. Clinton has, Senator Clinton has uh, put out one policy paper over a year ago saying that uh, there needed to be a residual force in Iraq for three reasons, to stare down Iran, to hunt down Al-Qaeda, uh, which is there now even if it wasn't before, and to help the Kurds. She's been very quiet about it since then. And uh, Barack Obama um, they don't really have a read on uh, in terms of uh, what his plan vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds might be. But I think that they, they have some fears and some reassurance in the fact that they think the reality of what would happen in Iraq and, and some of the hard realities of needing to keep at least some force there and not pull out too quickly, they think that's going to dictate policy. And they don't think that, uh, the people I've talked to anyway, they're not terribly afraid that someone's going to go in and just yank the troops out immediately. Uh, at the same time, I think they fear that the people coming in now uh, are not going to be like uh, the neocons who uh, wanted to transform Iraq, and, and many of whom were, were personal friends of the Kurdish leadership, made sort of cultivated contacts with them. They're worried, I think, about the people who were in the Iraq study group, for example, who didn't include a single Kurd in their interviews and didn't seem to consider Kurdistan in, in their calculus. So there were that realists might be coming in to clean up the mess and some of them might be on the Scowcroft Kissinger model. Uh, yes? I, I just wanted to comment on that. I agree entirely that it's not a military decision, it's a political decision. And I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is that it's not just a decision on the US, part of the US government, but the government of Iraq as well. And what do they agree to? Because we're no longer in a position to unilaterally yeah, that's a fair point. Well, can I kind of follow up on that, Please. which is the well, United States and Iraq is going to conclude some sort of status of forces agreement, which has yet to be concluded. 
So that agreement presumably would also answer this question. I mean, that would be all part of the same package, right? Yeah. This bilateral military agreement. Yeah. I think that, were you, were you going to go on? No. no. I think that the, the question of permanent bases, I, I think that the United States has caught wind of how toxic an idea that is in the region. And even, even though now if you go to a base like Balad, uh, some of the bases there, when I've been uh, hitchhiking around on embeds, they're, they're cities. I mean, you have to take a city bus to get across them. It's not walk over to the cafeteria or walk over to your barracks. It's catch the number nine bus. Um, and uh, so these seem like permanent bases to me. It's hard to imagine, uh, well, how they could be much bigger anyway. But uh, the, um, the permanent base idea, I should say that probably the best uh, quote on this is, uh, I interviewed uh, Robert Gates for the book just a few weeks before he was offered the job of Secretary of Defense, which was great fortune on my part because I'm, I'm assuming he clammed right up afterwards. But uh, he was just musing. He didn't think anybody was going to be asking him about these questions uh, any time afterwards. And he just said, oh, I, you know, I think we're probably not going to be able to put permanent bases anywhere in Iraq. And I don't know if he still feels that way, because he's not returning my phone calls as well as he did before. <laughs> yes? We'll, we'll take one more question. But I mean, yeah, the permanent bases thing, I think, Quill, just, I mean, yeah. it's just a matter of what you call them. I mean, right. you go Kandahar, Kandahar Air Force Base in southern Afghanistan, I mean, it's, it's similar. It's a the city. And the, uh, these bases seem to be permanent, even if you call them something different. Right. And, uh, for example, uh, Peter Galbraith, who's written about this and is a, is a clear proponent of uh, Kurdish independence, has, has pushed the idea that if America were going to keep a residual force in the region, that it should be in Kurdistan because it's safer, it's easier, and it means you can have virtual withdrawal. You've left the troublesome part of Iraq for your forces, and yet if you wanted to carry out an operation where you hit, I don't know, an Al-Qaeda cell in Al-Anbar province, uh, you wouldn't have to reinvade the country and get that through Congress and the American public saying, why are we going back into Iraq? You'd already be there, but with all the benefits of having left. That's, that's mm -hmm. an idea he's pushing, not me. Yes, sir. Well, uh, they do have a lot, and I think that the, the Penjuin border crossing between Iraqi Kurdistan and Iran is now uh, perhaps the major crossing between those two. But you're linking an, an impoverished area of Iran with what had been an impoverished area of, of Iraq. Um, and I think Turkey's economy is just much, much bigger, and, and because it's uh, got uh, its ally, it's an ally of the United States. Uh, it doesn't have any problems going in there. You've, you've all seen in the news various inc incidents where Iranians were arrested in northern Iraq by Americans, uh, accused of being spies when, when the Iraqi government and the Kurdish uh, regional, Kurdistan regional government were saying, no, these people are our guests. They're our guests. Don't arrest them. So I, I think it's very problematic, and that's quite intentional on the part of the Americans. But there is, there's an Iranian consulate in in, uh, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan now, and I've been told you can get a visa in a day there. Probably not for reporters, unfortunately. Well, thank you very much, Quill, and uh, uh, we give Quill a round of applause, and then he's uh, signing books later. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>